Chen, and May Wang, this section's moderator. I am a master's student under Dr. Lisa DeWeiter's Smart Food Horticulture Lab at Washington State University Mount Vernon Research Station. Before we start, I have a quick note for Mac users. Please use your Google Chrome or Firefox searching engines because we had a technical issue on Mac server. If you have any difficulties dealing with your access, please let me know or use the support chat widgets located at the bottom left of your screen. This morning, we have three speakers and their talks are focusing on different perspectives of soil health. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Diana Dupont, Dr. Christina Lascano, and Dr. David Grenstein to our section. And thank you all so much for giving us today's talks. Dr. Tiana Dupont will give us a live talk and the other two professors have prepared their video talks. Okay, great on time. Let's move on to our first talk given by Dr. Tiana Dupont. She is an extension specialist and assistant professor at Washington State University. Dr. Dupont will talk about soil tray fruit orchids and what specially matters. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to type in the chat bar on the right side of your screen. We will answer them at the end of all three talks. Also, you will be promoted to answer a quick poll at the end of the session about your experience. Welcome, Dr. Dupont. Okay, well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. I'm pleased to talk with you all this morning. I want to give you a, a presentation about our recent project that we've been working on for the past four years. This is in collaboration with myself, Dr. Lee Kalsis and Clark Kogan. So you're all familiar with the concept of Liebig's barrel. This is a founding concept in the study of plant nutrition. And it's the idea that your yield is gonna be limited by the lowest limiting factor, generally thinking about macro and micronutrients. However, as our idea of soils has um, changed over time, we're now about soil, not only from the standpoint of nutrition, but also the physical and biological properties of soil. So if we continue this idea of um, a barrel as an illustration, we may have additional limiting factors um, in, in addition to nutrition, such as water availability or root health that are um, going to be affecting our um, yield and productivity. So I really like this um, definition of soil health, referring to the ability of soil to perform key ecosystem functions, not only sustaining plant growth, but regulating water flow and buffering and filtering of potentially uh, toxic materials and minimizing erosion. Basically realizing that we, we do have soil functions related to plant productivity, but there's other things that we want soil to do for us. So thinking about this function of maintaining plant productivity, there's a number of sort of underlying functions that we'd like that soil to be doing. So everything from root health to making sure that that nitrogen is available to plants over time, storing and moving nitrogen or water through that soil profile and competition and protection from pathogens. But what's tricky is there's a lot of different ways that we could measure these indicators. And growers were looking, are looking at this list going, oh my goodness, different labs are giving me different things. And I don't know which of those are important to me in my system. So particularly um, growers in central Washington um, orchardists were wanted to know which of these things are related to yield and pack out. So basically to their bottom line and what they're getting paid for. So we started this project um, four years ago. The goal was to identify a set of indicators that are useful to track in central Washington orchards, particularly which of those factors are limiting to yield and pack out. 
Basically, we wanted to go from a soil test like that at left. This includes all 21 indicators that we sampled in this project to something like that at right, which is a much simpler, easier to understand that is focusing on just a few key indicators um, important to the, the growers um, and what they're interested in. So the way we went about this was um, looking at match sites where we had a high productivity site and a low productivity site as um, indicated by the grower. And we wanted to make sure that they were well matched. So what's tricky in a perennial system is we need to look at not only variety and rootstock and the soil type in that area, but also training system, age of the block, and so forth to try and get at just what's the difference from soil health um, versus uh, our, the rest of the production system. So out of the 100 sites that we sampled, about 60 of those sites were well enough matched to be included in um, the analysis looking at the relationship with yield and packouts. These sites were located throughout uh, the central Washington orchard growing region, um, all the way from Canada down to Oregon. In each, in each site, we took 50 to 100 soil cores, um, bulk those together, mixed them up really well and subsampled, and then sent that out for analysis to the Cornell Soil Health Lab, as well as to Spectrum Analytical for major and micronutrients. And then in our lab, we looked at nematodes, microarthropods, and root bioassays. And in the field, we looked at infiltration and um, compaction. We also accounted for irrigation and crop load um, in order to make sure that we weren't looking at, um, for example, a problem with irrigation, but looking at things that are actually related um, to the, the soil health parameters. Let's look at some of these um, functions and indicators that we looked at. The first set of um, uh, parameters that we looked at related to root health was an apple root health bioassay. This is comparing seedling growth in pasteurized and non-pasteurized soil. Um, the seedlings are grown for five to seven weeks and we look at height and weight um, to look at the relative pathogen pressure. Basically, you can have some samples like this at left where the seedlings look quite similar in the pasteurized and the field grown soil. And some like those at right where the seedlings grown in the, the field soil were much smaller than those grown in the pathogens, or excuse me, in the pasteurized soil indicating pathogen pressure. We also did a bean bioassay. This is one of Cornell's um, uh, assays that they use as well. And this is pretty straightforward. You're growing beans in field soil that then um, you rate those seedling roots after five to seven weeks to see how many lesions you have on those roots and on the hypocotyl area. Basically, um, where you have more brown areas on these roots, you're going to have a higher number indicating higher pathogen pressure. The root health bioassay results are shown here. This is the bean root health rating. We're gonna look at a number of um, figures that look like this. So I just wanna briefly explain what you're looking at here. So in all of these figures, you have um, on the X axis, the actual measurement that we took. In this case, a rating from two to nine, um, shown from two to seven here, and a score. This is a percentile score where you're looking at um, zero to 100. 100 is a high rating, so an A on your math test there, versus zero to 20 is gonna be the low end of the range. And these percentile scores are sometimes based on the means and standard deviations and sometimes based on a, an actual measured range that's known to be important for that individual factor. 
Looking at the root health rating for the apple root health rating here, you can see that about half of the orchards that we measured showed some degree of pathogen pressure as indicated by this apple root health rating. So let's look at um, what this is actually looking like in the field, um, an example of where this matters. These are two of our match sites. The block at the top is um, the, the high productivity site and the block at the bottom is the lower productivity site. And you can see that those lower productivity trees, in this case, it was quite dramatic. They really didn't fill their space. Um, they're, they're not reaching that top wire, um, quite stunted in some cases. And this, I will admit, was um, probably the worst part of this particular field. And that effect affects their yield and pack out. When we look at the measurements we took, both the lesion nematode and the apple root health bioassay ratings were quite low in this low productivity site, indicating that that may be one of the restricting factors on that farm. We also looked at plant parasitic nematodes. As many of you might be familiar, plant parasitic nematodes are important because they have this needle-like stylet that is going into the plant roots and is disrupting the, the nutrient and water movement throughout the plant. And also those small holes that they're making will actually allow fungal pathogens to get into those roots and create a higher fungal pathogen pressure. For, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, this is a Pratolanchus penetrans nematode, and you can see that needle-like stylet in her mouth that she uses to suck the juices out of the plant um, and do her feeding. In the sites that we measured, 15 of the 101 sites we looked at had um, high lesion nematode numbers above 80 lesion nematodes per 500 grams of soil, which is considered to be a problem in young trees. Looking at two of our match sites, you can see that the site on the bottom here um, has some areas where trees had to be removed and replaced and generally lower vigor of those trees. And again, looking at those um, scores, the lesion nematode numbers in this site were quite high, 129 lesion nematodes per 500 cc's. Um, and that score was also, of course, then low. And here's the apple root health bioassay from that site. And you can see that those seedlings grown in the field soil were quite a bit smaller than those in the pasteurized soil. But I don't want you to think that all of the nematodes in our soil are detrimental. Um, we also have bacterial feeders, fungal feeders, omnivores, and predators in the soil. And they um, are, can be quite important and also reflect the rest of the soil food web. In particular, we looked at what's considered to be a structure index in the soil. This is looking at the numbers of omnivores and predator nematodes in the soil compared to the rest of the soil food web. And this is an indicator of the complexity of the soil food web, as well as the amount of pest suppression. Think of it like when you have lots of bears and eagles at the top of the food chain in an above ground system, you know that it's a pretty stable ecosystem. And we had a pretty wide range of soil structure scores you can see in these sites that we measured. Nutrient availability is of course an important function in soil that's been long established. So we did look at macro and micronutrients in these sites. In general, our micronutrients were all within range, and you can see that with the macronutrients and pH, our pHs tended to be high. This is pretty typical in um, this region of central Washington. We did have a few low phosphorus um, and a number of high potassium numbers, but in general, the growers were already managing their macro and micronutrients quite well. The soil biology in soil is um, always super important and, and quite complicated because it's involved in so many different functions of soil, particularly nutrient cycling and pest suppression. 
a kind of fun way to look at the biology in soils is looking at the microarthropods. These are things like springtails shown here in the bottom left hand corner um, and soil mites that we find in the duff layer in the soil. So in our orchard soils, sometimes we have quite bare soil under the tree row, but other times we have a lot of leaf litter and grass material um, and uh, small material that's considered the duff layer in the soil. And that's where we see a lot of these microarthropods. We measure them, but with a modified Berlazi funnel, they're basically running away from the light here down into an alcohol at the bottom of that jar. And then we're able to count those numbers. Our microarthropods in the soil were highly variable, but in about um, 10 field sites, we had more than 20,000 microarthropods per meter squared. And so that's a lot of potential nitrogen mineralization from the fungal feeding um, or fungal grazing, um, both mites as well as springtails in those soils. We also looked at several indicators of microbial available nitrogen. Um, and this is a pretty tricky measurement and there's a little bit of debate about which if any of these are the best indicators. But if we look at these numbers, we did find that even the average potentially mineralizable nitrogen level was giving us about 50 pounds of available N over the 20 week season. And so this seems like something we can't ignore because in our orchard systems, if we over fertilize for, with nitrogen, that can cause um, problems for um, our, our fruit trees. We also looked at respiration. This is an indicator of the overall microbial availability in your soils. It's the measuring the CO2 that's released from their metabolism. Interestingly, we had relatively few sites with a high respiration level. Um, only about 10 sites. And that be, could be because respiration is notoriously a variable measurement, but it also could be our um, organic matter levels do tend to be quite low in this region. And not surprisingly then, um, the, rest, the microbial communities might be a bit smaller. In our area, factors related to water are quite important. This is a very dry area. It's irrigated agriculture. And so we looked at a number of different measurements that are going to be related to water holding as well as movement throughout the soil. We'll touch on in particular available water capacity. So available water capacity is measuring the amount of water held in the soil, the amount of water between field capacity, which you probably know is the amount of water that's in that soil when it's had a chance to drain but not dry and the permanent wilting point, which is a small amount of water that's held so tightly to those soil particles that it's not available to plants. So this available water capacity is gonna to tend to be higher in clay and loam soils, as well as soils with a larger amount of organic matter. In our sites, 5% of the sites had severe water limitation and 11% um, moderate water limitation based on this available water capacity measurement. So to give you two examples of what this looked like in our sites, this was one of the orchards that was located right on the river. This is very sandy soil. And you can see that this bottom site um, was pretty severely limited. There was a number of different things going on in this site. But in particular, it was quite sandy with low available water capacity, which was likely contributing to the low productivity in that site. More typical was an orchard like this. This is actually a large Granny Smith block where some parts of the orchard um, had lower growth as well as lower yield. And you can see that both the available water capacity and the percent sand um, were lower um, in the sections of the, excuse me, sand was higher and available water capacity lower in the sections of the field with um, lower yield. We also looked at soil structure using a number of different measurements, including bulk density and compaction as well as water uh, um, stable aggregates. 
Thinking about compaction, this is particularly important because it's going to be showing where our root growth is limited. The way we measure that is using a soil penetrometer that you're pushing into the soil when the soil is at field capacity. When you reach a hard layer, you'll see that the gauge on that soil penetrometer is getting up over 300 PSI, indicating where you might have limitation to those roots. We did have a deep soil compaction layer in about 25%, so 26 of our 101 sites. We won't talk about the um, wet aggregate stability and bulk density measurements, but we did also look at those in these sites. To give you one example, these were two very well matched Ultima Gala blocks um, right across the drive row from each other with a slightly lower productivity in one of those blocks. And this was tricky because when we first measured in these blocks, we really weren't seeing um, a difference and we were kind of scratching our heads, what might be going on here? But when we went back to take our compaction measurement, which had to be done later because you need to be at field capacity, we did see a deep compaction layer. You can actually see it here where we dug it up, um, which was likely limiting root growth down into those deeper depths. So soil organic matter is particularly important. You guys are all familiar with that um, and drives multiple ecosystem functions. So I wanna spend just a couple minutes here um, explaining some of the different um, measurements and we'll show a short video here. Organic matter includes the living, dead and very dead material in the soil. The active pool of organic matter is the freshest organic material plant and animal residues that have just begun to decompose. This dynamic part of soil organic matter tends to be highly related to nutrient supply, improved soil structure, water infiltration, and stimulation of microbial activity. It is a measure of the small portion of the organic matter that can serve as an easily available food source for soil microbes, thus helping fuel and maintain a healthy soil food web. One way to measure active carbon is permanganate oxidizable carbon. This is a field demo adapting a laboratory technique. First, you add two mils of permanganate to your vials, then add 18 mils of DI water to each tube, filling to the 20 milliliter line. Then add 2.5 grams of air dried sieved soil to each vial. Shake for two minutes at about two strokes per second. Let stand for 10 minutes, allowing the soil to settle. Add half a mil of the liquid from the upper part of the suspension to a second tube of 50 mils of distilled water. The permanganate oxidizes the active carbon and loses some of its color. The more active carbon found in the soil, the more the purple color declines. This color change is measured with a spectrometer or a colorimeter. Here you can see that the orchard soil with more active carbon is a lighter pink color. Another measure of active carbon is the particulate organic matter in the soil. Here we have washed the soil through a series of screens and remove particulate organic matter. You can see that the soils with more organic matter additions have more particulate organic matter. Organic matter additions such as compost, organic nutrients, grass clippings, and wood chips are important to build the active carbon pool of our organic matter as well as stable organic matter over time. Okay, so sorry if that was a little bit quiet, you guys. Um, so our active carbon results from these sites, we um, had about half of our sites have a relatively high and some are relative, the other half are relatively low. 
active carbon measurement based on that permanganate oxidizable carbon. So again, this is that readily available carbon that will be readily available to the microbes in the soil um, and is probably more recently um, incorporated into the soil. So let's spend the last four minutes on which of these indicators were useful to track in central Washington orchards. So what did we learn from this study? So to get at that, we needed to know our yield. So we got that two different ways. One was grower three-year averages, and the other was taking measurements in the field from a subset of those sites. Dr. Lee Kelsis lab also rated that fruit for common defects. So things like sunburn and bitter pit in order to get at packed boxes per acre. So this is what we're actually paid on in tree fruit. So it was an important um, measurement. We did a number of different analysis um, in these sites. Uh, one that turned out to be particularly useful is a linear mixed effects model looking at the association between yield and each of the selected indicators which showed strong trends in the exploratory analysis. We found that available water capacity with a threshold of 0.15 and percent sand with a threshold of 70% had significant models. And we saw that Pridolanchus nematodes with a threshold of 80, and the mean root health rating with a threshold of four had consistent but not significant models. Clark then constructed a model which combines the factors for each of these variables that are most important into three factors, water availability, root health, and nutrient availability. We now have a model that we can test for orchard systems. In this model, um, each factor affects yield only after it goes past the designated threshold. The factors are cumulative. So for example, if you have both low root health and low available water, that's gonna be an added effect in the model. The model is also nonlinear because these factors can be related. So we now have a minimum data set for the soil health indicators that we um, think is important for central Washington orchards. Based on our work, we think we should include indicators of water availability and root health, as well as fertility indicators to meet stakeholder management goals. The high levels of mineralizable nitrogen in some orchards indicate that we need to include some type of a measurement of organic nitrogen availability. And with more than a quarter of the sites we surveyed with high subsurface penetration resistance or compaction, some type of a measurement of compaction should be included. While organic matter and active carbon weren't correlated with the stakeholder management goals of productivity, we know that they're related to many other soil functions from microbial activity to um, carbon sequestration. And so we think that those should be included also in this minimum data set at least from a draft level as we move forward. So with that, I wanna thank all of the growers who helped us sample in their blocks, as well as the Tree Fruit Research Commission for their funding. And I'll turn this over to the next talk and we'll be asking questions um, at the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dupat. We'll meet you short after in the Q&A session. Okay, let's move on to our second talk given by Dr. Christina Lescano. She is a soil biologist and assistant professor at UC Davis. She will talk about soil health in vineyards. I think we are ready to start. This talk will take about 30 minutes. Hello everyone, my name is Christina Lascano. I'm an assistant professor of soil ecology at the Department of Land, Air and Water Resources at the University of California, Davis. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about supporting uh, soil health in vineyards. And I will focus more on what we don't know on current knowledge gaps rather than on what we already know. And so I'm going to be going over some of the projects that I'm working on currently together with my collaborators at UC Davis, at USDA, and also at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. 
the increased awareness about the importance of soils as essential non-renewable resources, not just for crop production, but also for environmental quality and climate change mitigation had spurred a lot of interest in soil health in the last years. We know that a healthy soil is a soil that provides functions and ecosystem services that allow for, so, for plant, human and animal life um, to occur. Some of those functions of a healthy soils span across um, physical, chemical, and biological soil properties that we have represented here in this slide with different colors. So for example, in regards to physical properties, a healthy soil provides, uh, stores water, but also has good uh, infiltration and drainage. If we think about agronomic properties, uh, we have here in green, um, a healthy soil is able to support not just a high yield, but also high crop quality. In terms of biological properties, healthy soils are diverse and microbially active. In terms of environmental functions and climate change mitigation, a healthy soil stores carbon, but also doesn't emit a lot of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. And if we think about chemical properties, a healthy soil provides nutrients, but also recycles nutrients as, uh, within the system. We measure soil health by using a series of indicators of all of these functions and properties, right? And we all know uh, a lot of different options for those indicators. Uh, however, what we should also know is that the properties of soil health and indicators that are to be targeted through management are usually weighed differently for different crops, depending on production goals and also depending on site-specific challenges. So that means that the definition of soil health might actually be different for different crops. So for example, if we think about corn, the requirements of corn are extremely different than the requirements of wine grapes. How different are they? So think about corn. Corn is grown, for example, in, a, in very different regions than wine grapes, right? So what do we need in, uh, for, uh, in terms of soil health for growing corn? Well, corn has high nutrient demand, so we want a soil that is able to support high yields, and in grapes, yeah, we do want uh, a soil that is able to support high yields, but we want to focus on grape quality, right? So that's an, something but that it's important. In corn, because of the high yields, we want the soil that it's able to supply high amounts of nutrients, but because we want to be environmentally sustainable, then we want that soil to retain nutrients and recycle them as well. In grapes, um, grapes do not require uh, high nutrient inputs. So definitely we don't want to have uh, a soil with a high, a lot of available nutrients. And what we want is a soil that recycles nutrients and retains them. Water availability and water storage is also important in, in the case of grapes. Grapes are grown in the case of California in uh, areas where drought is very common. So we definitely want to have a soil that holds on to water. But on the other hand, we don't want a soil that gets flooded or water saturated very easily. So as I hope to have illustrated here, the requirements of wine grapes um, and so the, the the aspects of soil health that we need to focus on are absolutely different than what we need to look for in corn. So that takes me to the first question or the first knowledge gap that I wanted to talk about in this presentation, which is the definition of soil health for wine grape production. We do need a definition that it's crop specific. And I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, the importance of soil health is something that it has been acknowledged by uh, wine product producers um, for a long time. And the impact of the soil on wine quality and combined combination with the climate, topography, and grapevine variety, it's something that it's called the terroir effect. 
And this is a term that is very well accepted and uh, is very used in the industry. So the wine industry, the growers know and are aware of the importance of soils for the quality of the grapes. However, this new concept of soil health is not exactly the same as the concept of terroir. The soil properties that have been considered traditionally within the concept of terroir are properties like, for example, soil depth, mineralogy, cation exchange capacity, texture, drainage, and pH that are sometimes inherent to the soil and more dependent on the parent material and factors that are not very dynamic. Some of the factors that are dynamic that are included in the con in the definition of terroir are, for example, structure, infiltration, water holding capacity, and nitrogen supply. The concept of soil health incorporates a series of new indicators or soil properties that haven't been considered before. Like, for example, soil organic carbon, microbial activity and biomass, biodiversity, active carbon, aggregate stability, etc. So while managing the soil health might be implementing or uh, allowing for um, the full expression of the terroir, there's a series of soil health indicators that are also going to be managed for that might have an impact on wine grapes. And so maybe we need to redefine that concept of terroir and at least we need to investigate really thoroughly the role of these other the soil health indicators in wine grape production. So in order to address these questions, we're currently carrying out a project with the support of the Napa Valley Grape Grower Association and the American Vineyard Foundation in Napa Valley to define soil health for wine grape production. Uh, we're doing that uh, through semi-structured interviews with growers and vineyard managers, and also a parallel sampling and analysis of soil health indicators across different soils in the Napa Valley. This is a project that is currently led and carried out by the graduate student Noelimar Gonzalez Maldonado. This is a project that is being carried out right now, um, but I do have some preliminary uh, results to show you. Uh, we have been, we finished the interviews with the growers uh, this last year in 2020. Um, we kind of had to shift towards more uh, to, to the interviews and uh, postpone the soil sampling because of uh, COVID. Um, but we have really valuable information so far. In our interviews, most growers did recognize soil health as extremely important uh, for wine grape production. And their interpretation of soil health was consistent and also very specific. So growers relate soil health to a reduction in erosion, vine health, vigor of the vines, and also grape quality. This is the what the growers think that it's important. Uh, that, this is how the growers think that soil health might be related to their production calls. So an ideal soil, according to the growers uh, for wine grape production uh, involves balance. And in this uh, balance, growers take into account first soil physical properties. So they are looking for a balanced texture, which is usually loamy or slightly more coarse. Uh, and then second, they think uh, that chemical properties are important. Um, so, uh, and again, the balance comes, the concept of balance uh, comes back here. Um, a good soil uh, for wine grape production is a soil that uh, provides nutrients, but uh, not too many. So as to promote vigor um, and affect the, the, um, the, the quality of the grapes. So while growers acknowledge the role of soil physical and chemical properties, few growers actually mentioned the role of organic matter and soil biota. And there was a very diverse and polarized views on soil biological properties. Microbes were either friends, friends or foes. Um, so uh, we, we certainly identified this knowledge gap in terms of wine grape production and soil health. 
Um, we also identified uh, there's generally an uncertainty in how the practices, soil management practices, are affecting soil health, but also grape quality. The second um, topic I want to cover in this presentation is uh, once we define a soil health for wine grapes, then we need to start thinking about management practices. And for management practices, it's extremely important to establish benchmarks for growers. Um, so there's a series of practices that are considered the pillars of healthy soil management, which are mostly the use of compost, no-till, or the use of cover crops. And there has been extensive research over the last 20 years or so that shows positive effects of these practices on soil organic matter uh, in vineyards. However, the outcomes of these practices are extremely variable. And so for the same type of practice in different situations, different outcomes are observed. And it's also extremely difficult to predict because of the variability in outcomes, the effects or the impacts of the practices on grape quality. So this is something that the growers care about and that we need to, um, we need to address. In terms of what is causing this uncertainty and this variability in outcomes of soil health for the same management practices, one of the most important factors is uh, the variability that is associated with the type of soil. We have to think that not all soils are created equal and therefore we cannot expect the same out of them. And for example, Texture actually has a very strong effect on how much carbon can be accumulated in the soil. So a clay soil or a heavy with a fine, a, a soil with a finer texture will be able to accumulate more carbon and also faster than a soil that has a coarser texture. Therefore, we need to establish benchmarks for different soil types to generate realistic expectations on the management practices. This is an example of what I mean. Uh, there's extremely high variability within different uh, wine growing regions. This is a study that was carried out by uh, Kerry Sinworth and Kyla Burns back into, uh, was published back in 2015. And it shows how much, car how much total carbon in the soil can change within the same area. This is um, a study that was carried out in Napa Valley so all of these different areas are the different appellations within the valley. Um, and as you see, total carbon was extremely variable across the valley and the different appellations. So probably the soil health, the rest of the soil health indicators are also going to be extremely variable. So to address this issue, uh, we're studying the variability on soil health indicators into this context of Napa Valley terroirs. This is again a project that we're carrying out with the support of the Napa Valley Grape Grower Association and the American Vineyard Foundation. And so we want to uh, address questions like, for example, how much organic matter increase is reasonable to expect in a sandy soil versus a clay soil, how much microbial activity, how much nitrogen, et cetera. Something else that we want to address is what are the most important drivers of the soil microbiome uh, across different types of soils? And how is the soil microbiome related to carbon sequestration and soil health? And so to do this, we are collaborating with uh, Biomarkers, which is a biotech company, which is based here in Sacramento. And we're currently in the process of collecting samples and we expect to have results uh, hopefully by the end of this year. I'm gonna move on into the last topic that I wanna cover in this presentation, which is once we have realistic targets for management strategies and we can fine tune our manage management, then how can we optimize both agronomic but also environmental outcomes of practices? And I'm going to explain uh, this. 
So let's say, for example, compost application. This is a very common practice followed by uh, grape growers. Um, compost inputs supply organic matter to the soil, so they directly affect uh, the soil organic matter content. But most importantly, um, compost provides carbon and nutrients to the soil microbiome. The soil microbiome therefore is going to be fed and start to be active and it's going to start releasing nutrients. And therefore, uh, the compost is going to uh, release nutrients through microbial cycling for the plants. And it might have an effect on the vigor of the plant and the quality of the grapes, right? At the same time that microbes uh, decompose and assimilate the compost, part of the carbon and the nitrogen that it's uh, in the compost is going to remain in the soil and become soil organic matter. So this is uh, a positive effect for soil health. It, it could have different implications for uh, vine growth and vigor and for grape quality. And also, as the microbiome is activated, there could be consequences for environmental quality. One of the consequences of higher microbial activity and nutrient turnover is that the release of certain greenhouse gases is also going to be stimulated. And so an application of compost might be associated with higher emissions of gases like methane, nitrous oxide, or CO2 to the atmosphere. So they could be an environmental trade-off to the benefits of compost on soil health. So this is something that needs to be thoroughly investigated in order to optimize agronomic outputs, but also environmental outputs of these practices, right? This is a project that we're working on right now and it's being led by the graduate student Sufai Wong. Um, we're carrying out a field trial uh, with the objective of determining the rate of compost application that maximizes benefits to soil health and grape quality while reducing environmental impacts. This is a project that is supported by the California Department of Food and Agriculture and um, J. Lore Wines. In this project, uh, we are applying four different rates of compost. We have zero, two, four, and six tons per acre. And we are applying it to the vineyard following a complete randomized design. So if you see, look at this bottom uh, right part of the slide, you can see what would be an aerial view of the vineyard. Uh, we got four blocks. And within each block, we have the treatments, the four treatments. Uh, which are represented here in different colors. So blue is zero tons per acre, green is two tons per acre, yellow it's four, and orange is six tons per acre. And the, the treatments are randomized within the blocks. Within each block, we have uh, four lines of vines, and uh, which are the plots. And then within each plot, we have two different sampling locations, what we call functional locations, uh, the soil under the vine and the soil in the tractor row. And the reason for this is that, as you can see in this picture on the top of the slide, the management and also the look of the soil is already very different between these two locations, right? The soil under the vine is bare, whereas the soil in the tractor row has a cover crop, so it's very green. And the soil under the vine receives water and fertilizers, and the soil in the tractor row does not receive supplemental water, only um, rainwater, and, and does not receive, for, uh, well, it did receive compost in this case, but it didn't receive fertigation, right? So the compost was livestock manure compost, um, also with mixed, green waste and, and it was broadcasted to the whole field. So broadcasted to the soil under the vine and the tractor row once a year, usually uh, after harvest and before the first rain, um, usually at the end of October. 
after compost application each year, we went back and so we collected soil samples to analyze total carbon, but also active carbon, available nitrogen, and other soil health indicators like aggregate size distribution, water holding capacity, et cetera. And we also froze samples for uh, an analysis of the structure of the microbial community. After each application and after each rain event, we went to the field to collect uh, samples of greenhouse gases being emitted from the soil. And we studied CO2 and nitrous oxide. And at harvest, this happened already for two years, we collected grape samples to determine yields, but also chemistry in the grapes. So we studied bricks and cyanides, phenolics, malic acid, and TA. So I'm going to show you some of the results of this study. And this first slide, I'm showing the results of what we've seen in the soil. And this is uh, for active carbon or what we call poxin, permanganate oxidizable carbon. Before I move on, I want to explain how the graph is set up. So we can see here the concentration of poxy in uh, the soil at different depths. So we collected soil at the surface from zero to six inches next to six from six to 12 inches and then 12 to 24 inches depth and here you can see the soil under the tractor row and the vine row for each depth and within each location we have the four rates of compost from zero to six tons per acre so what we've seen is that there was a significant effect of the compost application rate so higher application of compost also produce resulted in higher levels of active carbon. This is important because active, active carbon, it's carbon that is um, sensible to manage, sensitive to management. And uh, it's an early indicator of potentially future carbon sequestration in the soil. So this is good if applying more carbon increase uh, applying more compost increase active carbon, potentially increasing carbon sequestration in the future. We also seen a significant interaction of location and depth, meaning that uh, there was a difference between locations. So the tractor rows had significantly more active carbon than the vine rows. However, this only happened at the surface interval. So in the zero to six inch interval. What happened with the greenhouse gases? So in this slide, I'm showing you the uh, emissions of nitrous oxide over three different seasons. We split the, the results here into uh, what we call um, wet seasons and dry seasons. And the reason is um, in California, there is very two very marked uh, seasons, the dry and the wet. Dry season is usually the growing season, so it's mostly uh, spring through fall. And then the wet season, it's uh, the dormant season, which is happens from fall all the way to spring. Precipitation and moisture has a very strong effect on nitrous oxide production in the soil. And so because of that, we decided to study these processes uh, and the response of the soil after compost application separate by each season. Um, so we have here represented uh, from left to right, the first uh, wet season, the first dormancy, the first dry season or growing season, and then all the way in the right, the second wet season. So there was no effect overall of compost application on nitrous oxide emissions. What we did see is an effect of location in nitrous oxide emissions. And this was remarkable, more like, it was uh, more obvious uh, during the dry season, where we've seen that the vine row had the highest emissions as compared to the tractor row. And the reason for this is that during the dry season, the vine row receives supplemental water through drip, through drip irrigation right? Dra the drip irrigation triggers the emissions, right? So in this case, these emissions are associated 
to irrigation, they are not associated to compost application. The next slide shows emissions of CO2. CO2 is a gas that is produced by microbial respiration, but also roots. The roots of the plants respire and they produce CO2. And here, we, again, we show the results by the season. So we have a wet season, a dry season, and another wet season uh, again. So as you can see, again, we did not see an effect of compost. So compost did not trigger a higher CO2 emissions from the soil, which is great. Um, but we did see, again, strong differences between locations. However, the differences shift depending on the season. So over the wet seasons, we saw generally higher emissions in the tractor row, as you can see very clearly here. The reason for that is that during the wet season, cover crops grow in the tractor row, and that generates more root respiration that contributes to CO2. And this, this trend shifted in the dry season where it was the vine row that had the highest emissions. And this is again due to irrigation uh, because supplemental water stimulates um, microbial activity over summer and microbial activity produces CO2. But overall, no effects of compost on greenhouse gas emissions. When we looked at the quality of the grapes, uh, here I am showing you uh, the effects of uh, compost on the anthocyanin, phenolics, or acidity in the grapes, and we didn't see differences at all um, with the different compost application rates. And the same happened with malic acid or pH and also yields. So compost application did not have an effect on yields or on grape quality, at least uh, for these first two years of the project. So the take home message is that at least in the short term, compost shows a potential to increase carbon sequestration um, by increasing permanganate oxidizable carbon. This is something that was remarkably higher in the tractor row than in the vine row. So what this is showing is that that overlap of practices of compost application and cover cropping, it's it has a synergistic effect on carbon sequestration. So better results are achieved when the two practices are stacked. Um, so there is potential for improving the outcomes of compost application by applying, by having cover crops. There was no difference, uh, however, of compost application rates on yields and also no effects on, on grape quality and none of the application rates had a significant effect on greenhouse gas emissions. So for this case, in the short term, going with a higher rate of compost produced the best environmental outcomes, uh, also keeping the quality of the grapes and the productivity of the crop. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to address them. Uh, this is my email and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laskanel, for, for this great talk. Our final speaker, Dr. David Grenstein, he recently retired from Washington State University Extension with over 30 years of experience working in soil health in drylands, irrigated orchard systems, as well as internationally. Today, Dr. Grenstein will provide a big picture discussion about soil health. This video talk will take about 25 minutes. Just a reminder, after this talk, there is a Q&A session. Welcome to our questions. Also, there is a quick poll about your experience in this session. Please fill in, thank you. Good morning, my name is David Granistein and I've been asked by the conference organizers to reflect on my career working with soil health and to add to the big picture perspective. One thing I've learned over the years is to take the time to dig into a topic from the historical perspective and benefit from the accumulated knowledge of the past and then try to use that to help us in the present. 
I will briefly look in, in my talk today at some of the terminology around soil health and soil quality, how it's changed over time, discuss uh, the, the knowledge and use of soil health, soil quality practices in ancient times, as well as some of the developments in the, from the 1800s through the 20th century regarding soil health and soil quality. And I'll end with a few examples of advances that I've seen in my career and the lessons they might uh, give us today. I will briefly look at some of the terminology used over time, then discuss what was said about soil health in ancient times, as well as key developments from the early 1800s to the 21st century. I will end with a few examples of advances I saw during my career, as well as some conclusions. Prior to the 20th century, the term soil quality and soil health did not seem to be explicitly used, although these are implied in terms such as tired soil, soil sickness, degraded soil, the Romans characterized soils as fat, lean, or in between, based on their characteristics. Tilth, an old English word from before the 12th century, refers to soil condition, particularly physical, but also recognizing the role of biology. Tilth could be good or not so good, referencing the condition or quality of a soil. During the 20th century, many other terms emerged, such as living soil, soil conservation, soil and health, organic farming, and more recently, soil quality, soil health, and regenerative farming. While the language has changed over time, similar concerns about soil are shared. Probably the oldest writ written reference to what we call soil health or soil quality comes from Vedic texts in India, perhaps 5,000 years ago. References made to practices such as rotation, multi-cropping, use of manure and compost, soil rest, legumes, and inoculants. They also discuss the connections among soil, food, human health, and planetary health, and humanity's responsibility to care for soil. Ancient Chinese writings and practice focus on keeping the soil from wearing out under their intensive farming by working with nutrient cycling, which includes returning human and animal waste back to fields, using legumes in rotation, and making compost. Some of these practices, such as composting, are still used today, and in some cases with the historic methods or in others with more modern versions. The Romans referred, refined and documented a lot of existing knowledge and practice on soil management more than they developed new ideas. Calumella is considered by some as the father of soil science based on his extensive writings in De Re Rustica. He covers a wide range of soil quality related topics such as legumes, green manure, manure, rotation, contour plowing, soil structure, reversing compaction, soil sickness, pit composting, liming, and methods for evaluating soil. Soil health related practice occurred in the Americas as well. The Iroquois and other peoples are known for the three sisters system of maize, bean, squash culture, along with regular additions to soil of organic amendments, such as fish heads. The three crops provided above and below ground diversity, nitrogen fixation, and soil cover. The terra preta or black earth soils of the Amazon transform the low fertility oxisols of the rainforest into highly productive areas. And this change has persisted for a millennium or more. It inspired the current interest in biochar as a soil improvement and carbon storage tool. The terra preta soils dramatically contrast with their parent soils in how they look, how crops perform, and how certain soil properties have changed. You can see that in these photos. Here's the original soil, and this is the terra preta soil established on the same original parent material. And then we can look at how some of the uh, soil properties have changed as cited in this 1994 paper with significant increases in pH, organic carbon, and exchangeable calcium.
Moving to the early 1800s, the emerging science of chemistry was being applied to questions about plant growth. Spengler and Liebig were key German scientists who applied chemistry to agriculture, showing that plants use mineral salts, disproving the humus theory, and proposing the law of the minimum for plant nutrition and soil fertility. This drawing of Liebig's barrel shows the concept, but it's interesting to note that none of the staves or limiting factors on the barrel uh, include carbon or organic matter. I think this was a pivot point in moving the development of soil science and agriculture away from the historic focus on organic matter to chemistry and in the process leaving behind arguably the single most important aspect of soil health. With new understanding of plant nutrition, people like John Laws of England developed processes to make synthetic and soluble fertilizers and also were visionary enough to establish long-term experimental farms to try to understand the effects of this new technology. Laws established the Rothamsted Experimental Farm, which now has produced data on soil continuously for 167 years. This graph shows some of the differences in soil carbon over time with the various fertilizer and manure treatments. The two lines on the top are, are two of the manure treatments and the ones on the bottom are the fertilizer. David Powelson spoke about Rothamsted in this conference on Tuesday morning. After the establishment of land-grant universities in the US in, in 1862, long-term experiments were set up in a number of locations to understand fertilizers, as well as to help generate solutions for the extensive soil degradation that had occurred in some places. More recent long-term experiments have been established to answer new questions such as the Rodal plots for comparing organic and conventional grain production. All of these provide opportunities to learn about soil health changes. Published results on soil quality related topics can be found from this period, for example, looking at this 1896 study of the effect of soil structure on plant growth, which shows some pretty remarkable differences. One thing I noticed in a re review of a century of dryland farming research that I did was how often the older studies from this period lasted for 10 or 20 years in contrast to the typical three-year life of research projects today. The ability to include longer time was crucial for those soil researchers to generate useful findings. Not surprisingly, the focus on chemical fertilizer led to a few dissenting voices. The, the rapid degradation of some newly developed ag land also raised concerns. F.H. King, a soils professor from Wisconsin and later with USDA, took a nine month trip to the Orient to understand how farmers there had managed to keep their soils healthy and productive and wrote the classic book, Farmers of 40 Centuries in 1911. Regarding the composting he observed on the trip, he wrote, this is a remarkable practice in that it is a very old intensive application of an important fundamental principle only recently understood and added to the science of agriculture, namely the power of organic matter decaying rapidly in contact with soil to liberate from it soluble plant food. Sir Albert Howard worked in India in the 1920s and 30s and observed a correlation between the quality of the soil around villages and the health of the villages the crops, the livestock, the people. This led to his book, The Soil and Health in 1947, which has influenced current thinking about agriculture and food. He also developed the indoor compost method to improve and scale up traditional composting, viewing compost as an important resource for soil. Eve Balfour in England, a founder of the Soil Association established long-term plots to compare organic with the new conventional cropping and brought focus on the living aspect of soil. From these pioneers, several new farming paradigms emerged during the early 20th century, including biodynamic, nature farming, and organic. 
Biodynamic came from the Austrian Rudolf Steiner and drew heavily from Vedic traditions in India. Organic clearly built on the Howard ideas. All placed soil as a central concern for agriculture and food. Then came the 1930s and the Dust Bowl in the US, which literally put soil as a crisis issue in the halls of Congress. The focus was on soil conservation as a national priority. Soil health and quality terms were not widely used as all attention was on stopping the degradation. The Green Revolution followed World War II with intensified emphasis on agrochemistry. Organic matter and soil health concerns receded further into the background. The emergence of organic farming in the 1970s, both in Europe and the US, brought a renewed focus on soil health and organic matter. This was followed by the interest in sustainable agriculture in the 1980s that recognized the important role of soil quality. The start of the USDA SARA program in 1988 provided funds to look at soil quality questions that helped launch the interest in soil health we see today. In 1991, the Rodale Institute hosted an international conference on assessment and monitoring of soil quality. This supported their focus on soil and health and brought leading researchers together to initiate a scientific and policy dialogue on the topic. The next year, the American Society of Agronomy, the leading scientific organization for soil and crop science, hosted a soil quality symposium at its annual meeting, providing important credibility to the topic. The event led to the publication of the book, Defining Soil Quality for a Sustainable Environment, edited by Duran et al., which set the stage for much soil health research to come. At the same time, the omics revolution was happening that has provided an array of new tools and techniques to study the black box of soil, soil microbiology. We saw parallel development of direct seeding systems and organic farming, both aimed at addressing soil issues, but with very different approaches. While these were initially seen as no-till versus organic, for example, concepts and practices from each are being blended with the other and are leading to real improvements in soil health. And recognition of the continuing global degradation of soil led to several United Nations studies and the designation of 2015 as the International Year of Soils. Soil health is in the news now and is being discussed by growers, consultants, and even by millennials in city coffee shops, as well as by policymakers and business leaders. This increased public awareness of soil health is a success as well. From this historical look, here are several themes that I took away. First, soil degradation has to be stopped. Erosion strips off the best soil first, negating efforts to improve soil quality. The value of organic matter has been recognized throughout history and proven by long-term research. Soil is a living system, not an inanimate object. Maintaining or enhancing nutrient and carbon cycling is an important part of soil quality. If the nitrogen is mined out of soil by cropping, the carbon goes with it. Observing changes over time led to the historical understanding of soil and the long-term research plots have become invaluable for this as well. A lot can be learned from observation alone and we should continue to use this. Ultimately, our management cultural and policy choices can shape whether farming practices improve or degrade soil. Both are possible. Now I'll reflect on a few specific changes I have seen in my career. When I moved to Pullman, Washington in 1983, this is the kind of soil erosion that was common over the winter. The rule of thumb that was, a, was that about five bushels of soil were lost to erosion for each bushel of wheat harvested. Average annual soil loss around Pullman was 15 to 25 tons per acre with extremes up to 200 tons per acre. Certainly not sustainable. That has changed dramatically over 30 some years. A no-till winter wheat spring barley system 
had average measured erosion rate of 0.1 tons per acre, which is below an estimated rate of soil formation of 0.4 tons per acre per year. That is clear progress and soil health parameters are improving. Another change has been the wider adoption of compost moving from small organic farms onto large commercial farms. These commercial farms often use both synthetic fertilizer and compost and find this to be a winning combination for soil health and crop productivity. Several companies in the Columbia Basin of Washington specialize in managing the manure on livestock operations, converting it to compost and spreading it on fields using GPS guided equipment for precision application. Composting has turned waste problems into valuable farm and soil solutions. Earlier, I mentioned the omics revolution. A colleague and I, uh, a colleague that I worked with on apple replant disease, which is a widespread soil health issue here in central Washington, implemented genomic techniques to monitor soil biology changes as he looked at what practices might substitute for soil fumigation. Here is a genomic fingerprint of rhizosphere, rhizosphere fungi in apple from the untreated control in the fumigated plots on the right, which showed a, a difference initially in the study, but were the same after a year. And that's compared with the brassica seed meal treatment on the left, which dramatically altered the fungal community in a more durable manner. This shift can help explain why the trees in the seed meal plots, which is the green line in this graph, grew better and yielded more as in the bar on the right, compared to the fumigated, which is the red line, and the control in the blue line. So the advances in genomic techniques over the past decades allowed connecting the dots of management practice, soil biology change, and tree response. There have been advances with soil health assessment in general. When I started working on soil quality in the late 1980s, we had the standard chemical nutrient tests that were affordable and widely available, and the results were readily usable by growers. There were soil physical tests, some of which could be done by growers or consultants, but mostly they were research tests. Soil biology tests were scarce and found pretty much only in research labs. So we looked at a number of novel tests to see if they could be useful, including some qualitative ones, such as the biodynamic chromas shown here. This slide shows humus extracts from adjacent soils, same soil type, differing management history, eluted with silver nitrate onto filter paper. It is clear that the humus is very different between the two. A virgin soil on the left, which is in a cemetery with permanent grass cover, looks very different uh, to the adjacent field that represents over 40 years of intensive wheat pea tillage farming. But even with professional help, I was not able to utilize the information in these chromas very effectively. The paired field comparisons were, however, quite useful in showing that management practices can make a difference in soil quality over time and that some of the changes appeared to be economically beneficial. Here is the garden hose test a colleague and I used to compare soils from adjacent fields. Same soil type with continuous corn, anhydrous ammonia, heavy equipment, lots of tillage on the left, and more diverse rotation with forages some manure additions, less synthetic fertilizer, and smaller equipment on the right. From each field, we dug out several corn plants with a cubic foot of soil around the roots. We then ran a water hose on each for 10 minutes and observed what happened. On the left, all the soil washed off after two minutes. On the right, little soil was removed after 10 minutes. This had clear implications for resistance to erosion. We also identified benchmark soils of a particular soil type, which were analyzed in depth and understood as having desirable soil quality. These then could be used as reference points for fields with the same soil type, but with different management uh, to see what practices might move a soil towards the more desirable benchmark condition. 
The lesson learned was the value of a reference point in soil quality studies and comparisons. Integrating soil assessment information is another challenge that has, been, that has seen progress. At the 1991 Soil Quality Conference, we all imagined what a soil quality index, considered by many the holy grail of, of uh, soil assessment, what that might look like. One number that would encompass a variety of soil quality measurements and give an overall assessment of that soil. Well, that day arrived a decade ago. I can now send a soil to Cornell or some other labs and get back a soil health report card like the one shown in this slide with one number at the bottom. Perhaps as important as the overall health score though, are the weak or vulnerable parameters that are, that are pointed out. They, these can become the focus of management interventions to achieve the uh, most imp soil improvement for the investment. However, this testing does not always correlate with crop performance. The report shown here is for an irrigated potato field in central Washington that produces extremely high yields. In this example, the low scoring parameters are apparently not limiting yield, but the tool was not yet correlated to the soil crop and region. This is inherently a low organic matter coarse textured soil. Is it soil health poor? Does it need to be changed? We need to learn how to use these assessment tools better and recognize where they are best applied as well as where there are any limitations. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has had soil quality soil health initiatives for a number of years now. They have proposed four key principles for soil health that I find very useful. Minimize soil disturbance. Keep the soil surface covered with crops or residues. Have diversity above ground and below ground and have living roots in the soil for as much of the year as possible. Without any testing, a grower can make management changes and determine whether they are moving in a positive or negative direction with regard to one or more of these principles. For example, instead of leaving a field bare over winter, a grower could plant a winter rye cover crop. This would increase soil cover, add diversity, and lengthen the time period with living roots, touching on three of the principles with one practice change. The more positives, the better. These principles offer another way to guide soil health improvement along with the soil health testing. Here are my final thoughts. Be clear about what problem you're trying to solve via soil health assessment and management changes. Use the soil health principles to guide the overall management approach and practices. All of our old and new analytical tools can be useful. Be selective in using them in appropriate ways and where they can give the, the biggest benefit. Avoid analysis just for the sake of analysis. Let's elevate are thinking about carbon as an essential nutrient equal in standing to NPK. Carbon is not an essential soil nutrient for plants, but it is an essential nutrient for soils. And finally, uh, while Spengler and Liebig disproved the humus theory, history has proven that soil organic matter or humus is critical for soil health. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Granstein. Thanks for listening to our free talks um, for today's morning section. We got a lot of questions for our three speakers. Um, Dr. Diana Dupat already answered um, all the questions uh, listed in the chat box. Please refer to the um, chat box in the final loop. If you have further questions, please let me know. And I have a question for Dr. Dupat. Um, I just curious, 
Western Washington state got a lot of rains in the winter season. Do you think that can impact soil health compared with, compared with somewhere that has dry uh, tree fruit or orchards? Right. So I think one of the important things to think about as we're developing soil health indicators are making them crop specific and regional specific. So it's not so much that the rain would impact um, the, the thing that you're measuring in the soil, but it's going to impact which of these factors are most important to us. So in our irrigated area in eastern Washington, um, where we're getting limited water, um, it definitely seems to be very important in our systems, um, the water availability. Um, certainly there's many other factors, but um, so that's one of the reasons why we're, we're assuming that these available water factors are turning out to be more important in our analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, I got one question for Dr. Christina Lascano. Someone asked about questions for the compost. Um, what was the compost made of? Do the wine yards compost grape seed and grape must? Do you apply them in the soil? Uh, we can now hear you. Or I can move to the question for Dr. Grunstein. Okay. Um, Cheyenne asks you, um, do you have any book recommendations for reading about history of soil and farming around the world? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, in my talk, I listed some of the more historical books that I I still like to read them because they're, they're really quite excellent. Uh, another one I didn't mention is by um, a fellow from the USDA named Loudermilk. And I think that was called The Conquest of the Land Over a Thousand Years. That's maybe more about the soil conservation, but it is a great job of uh, giving a historical perspective. But Farmers of 40, 40 Centuries, The Soil and Health, excellent uh, books to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is how, how the yield is affected by the microbiome diversity and activity. Um, it's very useful, useful to introduce some microbials in soil like bacteria, mycorrhizae, and trichoderma to protect the roots. Well, in that, in that particular study I was referring to, my, my recollection is that uh, diversity was actually slightly lower with the brassica seed meal. And, and that was one of the observations that Mark Mazzola made is that our, our idea that more diversity is always better there may not be a great, you know, a huge relationship there. It's going to be fairly specific to the situation. Um, as far as introducing microbes, um, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can give a, a real strong answer on that. Maybe Tiana can. People have been trying some micro, mycorrhizal inoculants, and there's been some success with those on, on tree fruit to get, particularly on replant disease situations. Um, just adding microbes to the soil in general is pretty tough. The soil is a very competitive place and most of them aren't going to survive. And you're adding, you know, a couple million per acre and there's a couple million per gram of soil. Odds of effect are pretty darn low. The bigger impact change comes from changing the environment, changing the food source. And that's where you, you probably are going to have a more, uh, more success affecting the microbes. Okay, thanks for your answer. Um, I think Dr. Lascano is ready to go. Yeah. Um, do you want me to repeat the question again? Thank you. I think I remember. Yeah. So about the sorts of compost, the one that uh, we use in the trial that I presented, it's a mix of dairy manure and green waste. Um, but I know many wineries uh, are using um, uh, grape pomace compost. So it's a compost that is produced in house. Uh, by using the waste from winemaking and mixing it with pruning waste as well. And that works really good. Um, the important thing is to make sure that the composting process is done properly because grape pomace is really 
toxic for soils and for plants. So <laughs> it has to be really well composted, but it can, it can actually work out uh, really good and can be a really good source of carbon for the soils. And um, following up on the previous question too about whether you know it's good to add microbes or not, I agree with the other panelists. There's a lot of uncertainty in microbial inoculants. And so I would be really careful about recommending that. Um, some microbes though, they are naturally present in the soil like mycorrhizae. And so you can do things to promote those type of interactions. Uh, and those are very kind of robust and common interactions between soil plants and, and microbes. So, uh, and then I think the most important thing that you can do is to promote microbial growth and microbial life in soils. And you can do that in many ways by adding compost and, you know, by using cover crops that are going to kind of um, promote what's already in the soil um, and hopefully create a diverse and active community. Okay, thank you. Um, someone also asked, did you take soil samples before applying compost or after? Before, yeah, we did a baseline sample sampling in, in the soil to determine like baseline levels of soil organic matter and nutrients, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a question for um, Dr. Grenstein. Someone asked you, um, Brasca seed mill apl application on apples would brassica cover crop act similarly on apple root zone? Well, that was tried and it, 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 it wasn't nearly as consistent or as effective and Tiana may want to answer that. And that, that's partly why Mark Mazzola switched to the seed meal because it was a much more consistent and known product. You could apply it at very specific rates and get more consistent results. He ended up using a blend of two different types of brassica because each single species of brassica seed meal might control one or two of the pathogens, but then another one would emerge. And so the blend tended to have a bit more full coverage of the, the pathogen complex involved. But uh, like in potatoes here in Washington, growing, I believe it's the oriental mustard or yellow mustard has been quite effective in helping with some of the potato diseases. And they do use that as a uh, a green manure crop that they flail mow and then very quickly incorporate. So the management of it is, is important as well, not just the growing of it. Yeah, the, the trick with these brassica cover crops is if is you have to grow a large amount of biomass um, and they need quite a bit of water, quite a bit of nitrogen. They're a little finicky. So in the potato system, it works quite well. Those growers have um, good irrigation set up and it fits in their rotation nicely. In our orchards, it's a bit tricky because oftentimes between plantings, you're actually pulling out your irrigation. And um, so that's definitely a challenge. When I've worked with brassica cover crops in the past, sometimes we have great success and sometimes we don't grow enough cover crop to make it work. Um, and yeah, it's a combination of a brown and a white mustard that this particular product is that is used in, in um, Mark's trials. And it's important how it's processed, the grind, the size. If you wanna talk more about that, give me a call. <laughs> Okay, um, thank you. I got two questions for Dr. Let's Kennel. Um, someone asked about your data. Why do you think about two to four tons of compost acre seems to have the same result in compost per kilometer, kilometer gram soil? That's a great question. And uh, there are many reasons. Other studies have used, you know, same rates. They have same results in this, in the soil and the, greenhouse gas emissions and in the grapes as well. Um, so I think it really depends on different factors. One of them is that, first of all, this was a short-term study. So we are studying uh, changes in soils and in, in vines over three years. And sometimes that's not enough to see any change in soil carbon or grape quality. And then another reason is that um, these practices are applied in a wide variety of, of soils, which have very different properties and they don't always react equally um, to compost amendments. So the effects that you can expect and the benefits are actually different. And um, it might have to do, for example, with things like texture. This was a very coarse soil that uh, probably doesn't hold on to organic matter as much as a, a soil with a higher content of clay 
And therefore, you know, it takes a little bit more time to build up organic matter and to see anything significant, right? Um, so with this, I guess I'm, I'm not actually responding, but uh, saying that we probably need long-term studies uh, to really assess what the significance of the practices uh, for these type of crops that actually might take a little bit longer to see effects. And I, I might add that when we say a, a study had compost, compost can be a thousand different products and therefore your results from one study to the next, unless you're using exactly the same compost, that's a huge variable that is, is, is a lot of trouble in, in terms of trying to interpret results from compost studies. Exactly, yes. Okay. And then another, sorry, another thing is that many vineyards kind of stack practices. So on top of compost, they might use a cover crop or not, and then different cover crop species which have different impacts on soils, or they might till or no till, you know, and all of these things kind of add also uncertainty and complexity to the question. Okay, thank you. Um, someone also asked, are there any soil health indicators in your vineyards, uh, producers, uh, you know, vineyards and producers are more interested in uh, feel that have a, an impact on their grape quality? Yeah, I think uh, most uh, growers acknowledge the, the importance of physical properties. As I mentioned in my presentation, texture is important. Um, and drainage of the soil, it's important. And then they mentioned that um, what they look for in soils is uh, a balanced supply of nutrients. So it's important that, uh, that there is not a lot of available nitrogen at a given time for, for, crop, for, for this type of crop, because it's going to affect plant vigor and that can kind of have consequences for, for yields and quality of the grapes. So it's interesting because wine grapes are like, the quality of the grape is associated with a certain level of stress, which contradicts with what we want from a healthy soil. So kind of had to figure that out. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Dupont. Um, someone asked you, was your trail fumigated when seedlings were established? Trail fumigated. Um, so we were looking at um, existing orchards and trying to have match blocks where the, everything was the same other than the, the um, difference in, in yield so that we could see if the soil quality factors were involved. So um, the, the individual orchardists might have fumigated and in fact, most of the time, they probably did. However, that's actually not a question we ask them. And we were also not looking at the sites very soon after um, they were planted. And so um, things probably would have shifted, shifted a long ways after that. But for example, that site where there was really high nematode pressure um, had been fumigated, but there's some question of whether it was done correctly. Um, so certainly that's gonna contribute. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more question for Dr. Lascano and then we can move to um, all the general questions for um, open all the uh, speakers. Someone asks you, how is the relative paras uh, parasitism of the seedlings in the root bell assay related to the parasitism on the adult tree roots? I think that that might be a question for someone else. I think that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry, um, no problem. Um, yeah, so one of the things we're trying to figure out is what is a good um, indicator for root health in terms of pathogen pressure. So that's why we looked at both the bean bioassay and the apple bioassay um, in order to see if either one of those are a good simple indicator um, for what's happening out in the field. So um, Dr. Mazzola and others have worked with this apple root bioassay where you're looking at the small six week seedlings and seeing it to be um, quite useful. You're, you're, you're seeing the pressure from the known group of pathogens that are involved in replant. So Pythium, Rhizoctonia, lesion nematode and so forth. Um, 
However, there's, um, uh, you know, those plants are, anyway. Um, so the point being that the fact that we are seeing a correlation in this study is also um, supporting that these perhaps are good indicators of the, the field um, as well. Okay, thank you. Um, to co the question for all the speakers, someone asked, how might using drip with versus um, full archer sprinklers affect root growth and soil improvement? Does anyone want to answer first? Root growth and what was the last word? Soil? Um, root growth and soil improvement. Improvement, okay. And, and they were asking about what kinds of irrigation? Uh, drip irrigation versus drip versus uh, sprinkler. Yes. Yeah. Well, Christina, you you certainly saw that in your study. Yeah, I mean, I would say I, I don't study irrigation directly. Um, I'm starting to to do that uh, just recently, but um, I mean, just water availability supports microbial activity, so. That and microbial activity is very important for soil health and all the processes that are associated to a healthy soil. So the distribution of water that it's uh, related to irrigation is going to have a very strong effect in soil health. And, and that can be chemical as well. I know some studies done by the Nielsen's in Canada found some significant changes in soil chemical properties around the drip emitters if they were fertigating. So that's a very localized effect and even zonal effects uh, where if you're applying most of the fertilizer in the vine row or the tree row, they found a two, three unit pH differences between the tree row and the dry valley just based on uh, nitrogen fertilizer acidification over time. So you start to get these non-homogeneous conditions where as Christina talked about, you've got, a, and, and Tiana too, I'm sure, you've got to think about your sampling in some of these perennial systems differently than in an annual crop where everything's homogenized. Uh, well, and certainly one of the kind of standard things in our, in Washington orchards is they do generally use some micro sprinkler or larger sprinkler in addition to the drip to keep their cover crop in the drive row alive. And like Christina was showing that you have differences between that drive row and the, the area where the roots of the, the orchard are um, but from an erosion standpoint and other things, I, I do think it's quite important that we maintain grass in our, in our dry rows, but. Mm -hmm. That's okay. right. The lack of water can be compensated in the tractor rows with the cover crops. Yeah. Okay, that's great to know. Thank you all. Um, another question is farmers must decide how to use their crop residues leaves on the leaves on the field cell for feed process for compost or tar. what is needed for help do the right process for their farms well you know in in, in field crops row crops um, it really depends on the crop uh, i know one of the speakers yesterday was reflecting on the fact that we all think that removing straw, for example, is, is pretty negative and definitely over time it is, but it turns out that uh, the remaining stubble in the roots actually contribute a bit more to the stable carbon than the straw does. I think the number I recall is 17% of the straw return in a wheat field ends up as stable carbon. The rest is lost during decomposition. And so because roots have a bit more lignin, they, they probably don't lose quite as much to decomposition uh, as the straw. But in other crops, you know, like vegetable crops, there's just not, in potato crops, there's very little residue to begin with. It really doesn't have a huge effect, but you're, you know, you're not probably gonna harvest it anyways, but it's not a major contributor. Okay. I mean, I feel like we'd all love to know what's the perfect way to add carbon to our soils and manage our organic matter. and. Unfortunately, I don't. I think we don't think we're there yet. And part of it is seeing what's available in your system. And unfortunately, in our our central Washington orchard systems, we don't have the huge amount of organic matter inputs available from off the farm that they might in other regions. And so we have to try and figure out how to cycle that within our system. 
Okay. Well, that, that's why using things like the, I, I remember uh, a few years ago, I was involved in a big compost project, um, education project, and, and we highlighted the Gallo composting in Central California. I mean, it was unbelievable the scale that they had gone to to utilize the great byproducts. Mm -hmm. So that they, they were taking that back to the orchard. We've got material in the orchard that we can recycle and use uh, more effectively than perhaps has been done in the past. And uh, in California, the whole orchard recycling and almonds now is a big deal where they literally grind the trees up back into the soil. And we have some people here in Washington grinding their old trees when they're pulled rather than burning them. And then that material is put back into the orchard typically as a mulch. So those are some things that uh, can be done. There's windbreaks around some orchards. Those can be harvested and, and turned into chips. So there's some things like that to think about. They all come with a cost. Nothing's free economically or carbon footprint. But um, you know that's where trying to look at the whole system. We, we, we need better tools to do that uh, in an easier way. OK. Um, our next question will be, have you heard about coupling pH and riddles as a soil quality indicator? If yes, what are your what are your views on this approach? pH and what was the second thing? A redox, R-E-D-O-X. A redox, redox potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I worked with it years ago. I, I don't think we concluded very much, so I don't have any, anything conclusive to say. But yeah, we tried, we bought redox meters years ago and played around them, but uh, I don't think there was a particular uh, home run with it, let me say. I think both are very important variables for soil health. They regulate nutrient availability, so they're interesting. They're definitely indicating um, functions in the soil. Um, so, but again, uh, when we talk about indicators of soil health, uh, sometimes people are looking for this kind of the one soil health indicator that is going to explain everything. And that's not the case. Usually things are, are more complicated and what, what we need is a kind of a comprehensive assessment, which is also uh, tailored to you know the, the specific challenges of each site. And some places you need to focus more on you know physical properties because that's what you're having problems with. Uh, some places you need to you have nutrient imbalances that you need to address. So different indicators show different things. Um, and usually, it, I would recommend a more comprehensive evaluation of soil health. But the idea that one score is going to give you all the answer, I think that's yeah. what I've learned. We used to think that was the solution. We all wanted that. And really, the focus is on what, what, what's the problem and what are the, the limiting factors that contribute to that problem, as, as both Tiana and Christina have referred to. And one of the simplest things growers can do or other managers is, is you know, do your baseline assessment and then track it over time at the same location, same point in the, in the management cycle, same testing method, those are all really critical. And that's the best way to know whether your management changes are getting you where you wanna go. Yeah, exactly, I mean, we wanna to continue to look at what, are, what is the, the, the set of indicators that are gonna be useful in your cropping system for your goals and your environment. And we, we need to have tools that are robust, repeatable, so they're actually giving us good consistent results, but they're also related to constraints. And one of the things that we found, just to give you an example, we thought, oh, we're great, we looked at 100 sites. Well, our statistician said, well, you probably need to look at about 1,000 to really get a good solid set of indicators that you feel comfortable that you got all of the right ones. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got a ways to go to decide which are those um, sets we need to have. And, and I think likely you can oftentimes substitute out one or two for the same function. So really thinking about what are the functions we want in a system. Okay, thank you. Um, we got two more questions. Um, Dean asked a question about the commercial orchard. My conservation distinct applies an endal and actual micro, microsile root dip to trees and shrubs in the annual tree cell along terrasol to help increase seedling survival. What do the commercial orchards do?
Do you want me to repeat the question again? It wasn't clear what they were applying. Um, Some kind of a microbial. I don't know either. It, it just said like an idle or act, actual microzell root shaped trees and shrubs in the annual tree cell along the pterosaur. Uh, no. Yeah, I guess I would say there's a few people I know of that are, are doing a root drench, but it's pretty uncommon um, practice at planting in, in orchards. Um, I don't know, Christina, if you have any examples. I mean, there's also potential for moving pathogens around and creating other problems with root drenches. So it's something to be um, thoughtful about. Okay. Um, the last question is, there has been a lot of discussion about the importance of compost in these systems, but how important is the combination of mulch along, the, along with the compost? That's a good question. And I think you will apply mulch for different reasons. Um, mulch will apply, you know, it, it's used by some growers to reduce the use of herbicides, for example, um, because mulch can, kind of creates a layer that prevents the grow, growth of weeds. Um, and it can be used to preserve moisture under the vine. But so in one hand, I guess it can, mulch can, by creating that protective environment can boost microbial activity. But on the other hand, if you don't allow for plants to grow, then you, you lose that benefit and that interaction between the compost and a cover crop, for example. So I think both are used for different purposes, not incompatible. Well, and, and here in, uh, in Washington, central Washington orchards, uh, there's been quite a bit of work done looking at mulches as far as impact on the trees, the positive impact on the trees, there's been a much greater impact from a surface mulch versus incorporating that organic amendment in the soil. That's pretty well documented now. And it seems to be related to, in my opinion, this has yet to be really fully uh, teased out, but I believe it's reducing both uh, temperature and water stress on the trees. On the surface, where once it's incorporated, you lose some of those physical buffering effects and maybe you're tying up nutrients because a lot of our composts don't release nutrients when we think they do, they actually tie it up. So we tend to get a negative effect for a period of time. But yeah, the mulches have been quite successful and over time, I know one trial I had, we put on mulch and I came back six years later, uh, had been undisturbed there was zero mulch remaining on the surface. Every bit of it basically had been shredded and incorporated into the soil. So eventually it makes its way into the soil and becomes part of the organic matter without our having to do anything. Yet we got those benefits uh, to the crop while it was on the surface. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that there's a, like, a need to figure out what we can do with all those pruning ways, you know, certain Certain perennial crops like almonds, they have a lot of waste from the, the hulls and the shells, for example, that uh, we need to figure out what to do with them. And using them as mulch is a really good uh, use for those instead of burning them, for example. Yeah, and, and in fact, you know, it costs, it costs money to compost. It's quite expensive. And there are greenhouse gas implications for making compost. One thing growers here have started to do is, is combine recycling their prunings, which typically the prunings are, are brought out into where the tractor alley is, the, the drive alley, and they're shredded and they're left there on top of the cover crop. So they don't really add to the soil zone where your tree roots are. And now we have growers who have taken their equipment, the brush rake in particular, and they can sweep those prunings after they're flailed back onto the tree row, and I think with the grower I work with said it was about $5 an acre. Very, very inexpensive to utilize that carbon that's already there in a better way for the trees. And then they can take their mowing, which again, typically the mowers cut the, the cover crop between the, tre the tree rows and leave it there. There are mowers that will blow it onto the tree row. And so now we've got green and brown in the tree row, essentially a compost system doing its thing with very little intervention and the, the best benefits happening where most of the roots are. 
Yeah. So, you know, in a, in a re recent review that we did for an extension publication of organic matter inputs in orchards, like David said, we had more consistent impacts on tree growth from those surface applied versus incorporated organic amendments. However, I would say one of the two complications to those sorts of reviews is one, the total amounts of organic matter added could, were quite different in a number of those studies and sometimes quite small when you really added them up. So, you know, the amount of carbon you're, you're adding to the system is, is going to really affect as well as the composition. And, and then thirdly, um, the, the standard problem with research trials is too short, right? So the few trials that were long-term, um, for example, with the, the growing cover crop systems showed very different effects than the short-term trials. So um, we always, it's, those reviews are super helpful to show trends, but we need to be thoughtful about how much information they really include. Well, I, I would say the longest study has been that I'm aware of was done by Ian Merwin at, at Cornell in New York State, which is not a place of necessarily chronic water stress and chronic heat stress. Yet over 20 years of comparisons, the mulch trees on virtually every level were the superior choice, which was pretty interesting. So that it says there's something unique about the mulch that we don't necessarily get from other things. Okay, thank you so much for your excellent answers. We are quite a bit over the time, so I just go to the endings. It's my great pleasure to be a moderator of this session. I really enjoyed my time and I learned a lot of knowledge in soil health. Thank you so much for attending this section. Our next session will be held at 1 p.m. today. See you all there. Have a great day. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.